But uh, yeah, welcome Market Pulse members. We've got quite a lineup today just to give you kind of our outline. There's been a lot that's happened this week uh, from the conflict in the Middle East, uh, the attack on Israel, as we would say, uh, from this crazy conflict and weird uh, political rival on the right uh in congress right now and not having a house speaker our national uh debt starting to spiral a little bit and frankly uh a lot of political issues that need to be addressed while our political system is kind of in shambles so uh having said that we're going to kick off with our disclaimer and then we'll jump right in so let's go ahead and get that up and we'll jump right into the, into our trades that we made last week. All right. So today we're going to start with our trades from last week. And let me just pull up my charts here. Let's see if I can get this up. There we go. And gosh, guys, if you were on last Friday, this is why I do this. If you're on last Friday, we couldn't have called this any better. And I'm not. You know, I've been doing this for over 15 years, so I'm not patting myself on the back per se, but uh, this is the benefit you get for being on live, uh, whether you're joining us on YouTube or whether you're joining us on via webinar uh, as a Market Pulse member. The benefit of seeing this live or watching the podcast as soon as you can after is you get a glimpse of this data to kind of set you up for the week. So as long as you're watching this, and I'm just helping my listeners but as long as you're listening to this on Saturday or Sunday after it gets broadcast, uh, this will set you up really well for the open on gold, the open on the S&P 500 come Monday. And frankly, my S&P 500 overview should give you insight on kind of the markets in general as the S&P 500 represents kind of market totals. Uh, but let's let's actually take a look at what we're talking about here. I'm going to bring up my chart here and i'm just going to do a quick overview and then we'll actually do our gold analysis and then at the end of my webinar we'll do our uh, s p 500 analysis so here's gold as you can see i've made this easy i drew a line you guys can kind of see the line that i've put in place here um this line represents last friday and if you guys remember this was not up this high. Friday skyrocketed. In fact, as it broke through, remember how we talked about the breakthrough? It broke through this 1882 price. And I was telling people, guys, this is the easiest trade uh, setup that you could possibly put in. You're going to put your stop loss right here. You're going to put your take profits into here. And then you're going to be a little careful around this support, this, this long-term resistance on this channel. And you know you probably want to, put your your take profits somewhere in here well within that day after we got off the webinar friday that would have filled and then look what happened we couldn't have drawn this uh resistance line better the price really did start to resist at that level uh monday and into tuesday and then come wednesday we had another breakout which you could have done the same thing stop loss down here take profit up here and you would have grabbed that breakout as well. So I just don't know how we could have marked this any better. Uh, we're going to obviously redo this. But before we do, let's take a recap on our S&P 500 trade. Again, couldn't have done a better job on this. You can see, let me just kind of zoom this in. This line represents Friday. So this is Friday on the charts. And Friday, we said, look it, we're kind of sitting right on a support now resistance level at the 4331 level. And so we said, look, it's very likely that we're going to have some uh, capitulating at this price. And who knows, from a fundamental standpoint, Monday came in a little bullish. Uh, you might have some ups and downs. And so when this broke up, you could have taken a little scalp trade uh, towards the high side, obviously putting your stop loss below this. But even Friday, I marked this was the channel we were in this kind of new channel that was forming. And we also drew in uh, kind of my where I thought the price was going to go for the week. 
And I drew these little circles to kind of show where the price is. And sure enough, this is where we are today, uh, end of week. And so we'll do th- we'll do something similar. And if it gives us, normally I don't have this strong of opinion uh, when it comes to the market, but because of our technicals, we were in a short, uh, or excuse me, a long-term downtrend. We were in a short-term downtrend. Everything to me said, Matt, this is going that direction. We need to be putting ourselves in a position to be going short. And if not, not let's just do it because we're speculating, but if and when it breaks this 4331 level, you put your stop loss up here, take profits down in this region. You know, obviously the 50% level is not bad. Uh, the 33% level is a uh, much quicker target, but you wouldn't want to be going, you know, three quarters down between uh, your support down here and your resistance up here. So anyways, there's your recap. We're going to do a review now on gold, and then we'll jump back into uh, our news and all this craziness that's happening around globally. So having said that, you can see now on gold that we're going to have to do some new drawing. And this is a great opportunity for those of you who struggle with a strong backing and technical analysis, this is a great opportunity uh, for you to learn how to do this because we just had a breakout. And so you can see we had this extremely long uptrend, about a month's worth, month and a half's worth of a short trend. And this channel that we had going towards the downside, it was really strong. And so when we had the breakout early last week, which was Wednesday, I believe, of last week, it broke hard. And it and you can see it even broke through this uh, resistance level in 1980 or 1967. Now, a lot of this has to do with the global tensions, the stuff that's happening in, in uh, Iraq, as people start to turn towards other forms of assets other than paperback currencies, uh, just out of fear. And so this is a reaction to global fear. Uh, there's some stuff that's going on in the U.S. that I think people are positioning in gold also because the data is not that great. Uh, regardless of what you're hearing in mainstream media. We're going to talk about that later. But let's go ahead and get our new technicals in place. So we're going to leave this one in. It really isn't distracting that much. I'm going to kind of back it up, though, so that it's not in our way visually. So we're just going to kind of clean this up a little bit. And now we're going to figure out what kind of channel we're in towards the upside and you can see it's very clear uh in your tools are right here by the way guys here's your channel but it's very clear we're in an uptrend and you could say it's something like this yeah i like that and it's very steep and we talked about this a little bit last week, just so you guys can, it's it's just the law of probabilities. We talked about the steeper the slope, the higher likelihood of a breakout, right? Because when you get something really slow, really sloped and really tight, you don't have a lot of wiggle room inside of it uh, to, to be consistent in that channel. And so it's very likely uh, because of this, just like we saw in the S&P 500, it's very likely that we we're going to have a breakout. Uh, meaning it could break out to the downside because of how high it's positioned in this channel. It just keeps kind of ticking on the high side of the channel. You do have some relative uh, space to the downside, but you've got to remember that this 1967 price is pretty strong. And let me just double check that support. I just want to make sure I like that level still. Yeah, I like that. We're going to bring it up just a little bit. So I'm going to move this price up now that it's more of a support than a resistance. So it's more 1973. Let's see if I want to adjust anything else. We've got our 2000 level. I like that. I think that's going to be a soft support. And then really we've got, I'm going to draw one more line in here, guys, because we're in this territory. We've got this light support kind of right in this. Re- you see these little spikes here? So I'm going to draw a uh, resistance level 
now there. But you can see, guys, we have lots of room to go up. And because of these the space, a lot of people don't quite understand how the market works. But when you have these big gaps in price, like, for example, you can see how there was a lot of velocity in the market back here in uh, March. And when we came back down into the space, we had the same amount of velocity to the downside. And then when it decided to turn back up, you had similar velocity towards the upside. And the reason is, is these kind of gaps in the market aren't they're not factored in for. They're not popular prices is how I would say it. And there's a lot of tools that you can use to kind of help you see volume in terms of price, like what price points are really popular. But if your price point isn't very popular, when the price goes through it, it goes through it hard and fast because there's not a lot of what's called limit orders or people in options or people in the futures market that are betting against it at those significant prices. And so since there's not a lot of orders in line there, it eats the orders up and it just keeps moving through until it hits one of these prices where people put a lot of their stop losses, they put their limit orders in, and that's what actually creates uh, the support and resistance in the market is it's actually hitting real orders that people are placing that says, hey, if the price gets to here, get me in and sell or get me in and buy. And so you're kind of hitting this uh, floor and ceiling. And so when this happens, uh, you get the natural support and resistance. And this is this is why Fibonacci is such a powerful tool also. Uh, it kind of is this natural reaction that happens in the markets, us being the part of nature that creates it. And that's why you'll see a lot of Fibonacci patterns uh, oftentimes in candlesticks. But this is where I would be, guys. And then how would I trade this? Well, we're kind of stuck right between the support and the soft resistance. Uh, 2000 is going to be the price. I would be a little hesitant about a breakthrough here. I, I just, I know how 2000 is. We're going into Monday. Mondays are typically low volume trading days. Um, in fact, I had a chart that showed like trading days and trading hours for gold. Uh, maybe next week I'll bring that up. But what you can see here is it's more likely we're going to be living in this space right here next week let me just kind of draw the size i want but it's more likely we're going to be living in this space not towards the upside not towards the downside and i'm going to narrow this and the reason i'm going to narrow it is because i don't want to give you that much time uh in terms of seeing this and watching this podcast on tuesday and going oh well it's going to stay it's like no i'd give yourself one to two days of this likely staying in this price and you've got to follow i wish i could make a note for everyone to remember you've got to be following the fundamentals on this one because it's going to play a lot into if it breaks 2000 now because we're really close to 2000 what if we get a breakout into the above 2000 matt well that's going to be likely pretty steep meaning it's going to climb pretty fast it's going to be pretty volatile and you're going to want to make sure to have a really tight stop. So I'd be placing my top, my stops at like the 1990s, you know, somewhere in this range here. Uh, take profits, though, guys. Your potential upside is clear up into the 2050 range. So you probably want to take a, you know, halfway mark at like 2025 towards the upside. Now, what happens, Matt, if this breaks towards the downside? Well, if it comes down and it hits... Uh, 1973 and breaks down, you've got the same type of uh, gap, this massive gap between our support and resistance lines going back to the downside. And it just means you're going to have a lot of velocity. You're going to have a lot of speed. So the same thing, stop losses above, take profits in between. And if you're towards the downside, probably take profit of like 1928 would be uh, feasible. And it probably would get you out by the end of the week. So that is pretty much it. Um, I'm more bullish, just to kind of give you my positioning on this. I'm more bullish in gold than I am bearish. With a lot of the global events going on and data that I'm about to go through, I think the news is going to start catching up and people are going to start catching up to the sentiment of what's happening. Also, if you follow the VIX right now, the VIX has started climbing. And the VIX is a, a volatility indicator. And typically when volatility goes up, the market uh, tends to come down, especially the S&P 500. And so as people are pulling their money from that asset class, they're going to be looking for other places to put it that are stronger assets. Gold typically is the hedge. 
uh, along with some other, you know, obviously assets, but um, people aren't that bullish on real estate right now. So I think gold actually has some uh, some pretty strong bullish, pot bullish potential. All right, so there is our gold review. Let's go ahead and dive in to our news. Oh, you know what I was going to do today? You guys are going to love this. So I've been saving this, and I'm going to go ahead and bring this up, but let me share my screen really quick. We have kind of a psychology corner, and so this is going to be our psychology corner piece, and this is a piece of work that I developed years ago, doing a bunch of trainings and working with a bunch of students, trading in particular, a lot of them were people, traders, people who are uh, in the markets. And I used to fill the room with a couple hundred people and we would do these intensives is what I would call them, where we really got underneath the psychology of your trading. We really got underneath the belief systems that you have around money that were really getting in the way of you having success in your trades because it would cause you to break your rules. It would cause you to not live with the facts and the data rather than giving your opinions and your beliefs kind of this stronger uh, weight. And experiencing this, I found that integrity was the foundation that anything could be built on. And when you wanted something or had a goal, you know, let's say it's your trading account it's something to do with your financial future, some goal that you have. When things don't go the way that you'd like, it's because there is an integrity issue. Now, I bring this up, and it's very common in Christian culture, I found, that when I bring up the word integrity, morality becomes a immediate like uh, synonym. And it's like, I get it. And even in some dictionaries, there is some correlation between integrity and morality. But to be clear, we have to define my version of integrity before this makes any sense. So my definition of integrity is the state of being whole and or complete, like a bridge. And the best way to describe it, I've always found, is this bridge analogy. You know, if I'm going to take a big load of something over a bridge, you know, I need to get like some materials to a house or, you know, some type of energy to an energy source, whatever. Uh, and I decide to cross a bridge. It's important that that bridge has integrity. Now, the integrity of the bridge is measured by the ability it can carry the weight of me crossing and doing it in a way that is safe. And so if a bridge gets a hole in it, let's say there's a bridge and there's this massive four foot hole in the bridge, it therefore lacks integrity. Why? Because the structure itself is not perfect, whole, and complete, right? It, it does not fulfill on what it's designed to do. And so if I go to the hole in the bridge and I just try to ignore it, I am putting myself, my cargo, the things that I'm carrying across in danger. And so when things lack integrity, there is a natural impact to create chaos and to create more uh, breaks in integrity in other structures. And so I've developed this very simple five-step process to restore integrity because I'm just going to call you all out. You don't know how to do it. I'm going to say 90% of the people I meet truly do not know how to restore integrity. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So typically in being human, since we're not bridges, the way that we work in society is through our spoken word, right? So we use language to create. When you're saying you're going to grow your trading account, that happens in language. When you're saying you're going to have a goal to do X, Y, Z, that happens in language. And I want to give you a really easy example to kind of follow this uh, along, and that's being on time. We're all guilty of it. We, we've all dealt with a lack of integrity around being on time. But let me tell you what typically happens when it comes to time. You know, I run a very tight schedule. Uh, I would call myself a, a performer or someone that's in a high performance category. So because I'm playing a big game, I break, I, I fall out of integrity more than most people. And so this really is applicable to me because I have to clean things up really quick. And so let me just bring this back to me. If I have someone who comes in who's late, or let's say I show up late to an appointment and all I say is sorry, 
which is kind of this word that we learn to use as kids uh, or our parents taught us. And it's like, well, go say sorry. And then somehow that fixes me hitting my sister or that fixes the broken window or that. And it's like, it's bizarre, but we do it. And somehow we've signed off on this as a society. But if someone comes in and all they say is, yeah, I'm sorry for being late. And then usually what falls is a bunch of excuses. And I, the person that they were supposed to be on time for, just kind of accept it. I'm like, okay, well, you know, thanks for being here, I guess. You know, great excuse. There's traffic. If I did that, I would be letting them off the hook. And I would actually be creating a new agreement around what it means to be on time. In fact, I think the reason in society we allow people to do that, we don't hold people accountable for being on time, is because I want the same benefit. So when I show up late, I can say sorry to that same person, and they have to give me the same uh, the same consensus. They have to give me the same feedback back, right? Like, oh, well, I guess it's a big, not a big deal, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is there's a broken window, and it was called we're not on time, and there is impact to that, and it, it affects everything. And so I found that as I learned to focus on integrity with my finances, integrity with trading, my level of performance around it, whatever could be measured, went through the roof, like exponential growth. And so this is very applicable to traders, especially if you're not getting the returns that you like, you're not getting the output that you wanted. So let's go back to this. So what do you do, Matt, when you're out of integrity? Like, how do you fix this thing? Well, I find the first thing to do is just stop saying sorry. Because when you say sorry, it's this already programmed in, like I'm just going to skip a bunch of steps and I'm actually going to miss the thing that has me never actually look at the root of the problem that causes me to have a lack of integrity, this hole in the bridge. The second thing to do is to see the broken agreement. So when you are lacking integrity, if you're late, it was like, hey, you know, I was supposed to be here at nine. I'm, I wasn't here on nine. And I can see that I broke that agreement. That's all it is. It's just an acknowledgement of the of the agreement that you had. Three is where we start to get into that area that people never take it. You know, we all kind of do number one, and I'm telling you not to do it at all. Number two, most of us don't acknowledge the agreement. We, we actually make excuses, which is a good sign that you're not following this step. You've skipped step two, and you've gone into a lie. Like now you're spinning a web to try to make and justify your lack of integrity. Step three is getting the impact. And this is where it makes it real. And it, this is probably the most difficult part for people because there's this natural shame that humans have. And I remember it very well. But once you do this enough, you start to realize there's no shame in having a lack of integrity. All there is is impact. What happened is what happened. There's nothing shameful about it. I was late. The impact was we're starting late. The impact is we may not have enough time to get the meeting done. I might have been distracting. Uh, it's not efficient. And the world just doesn't work that way. Could you imagine your plane just like leaving whenever it wanted, leaving 15 minutes late? It wouldn't work because your next flight wouldn't work, right? So there are certain things where you can clearly see if there was a lack of integrity, the whole system would break. But this is your life. This is your finances. And it's really the same thing. It's not any different. Number four is to recommit or don't. We really have this weird thing also in society, especially with our significant others, where we make these promises or even unspoken agreements. And what happens is we feel obligated to recommit when the agreement, oh, I'm going to try harder. I'll do a better job. Oh, I'll remember the milk next time. I promise it'll never happen again. And we think that that's enough. We think that that is it. But what if you don't want to get the milk? What if this thing in business or this job you have or this relationship, you're, whatever, it just doesn't work for you anymore? And we just don't take the time to ask ourselves, do I really want to do this thing based on the impact? Do I really want to do this thing or not? And a lot of times when you look at the impact and you look at all the other things you're up to in your life, you sometimes have to say no. Like, nah. I'm not doing that anymore. And then, you know, there's going to be impact from that, but it really frees you up to have focus in the things that matter. And then here's the most important part. It's create something new. This create something new, I would say, again, 90 plus percent of humanity does not do this. But if you can get to step five, you know you're complete and you can know that you have restored integrity to the thing that you're doing. And so I, the way I always say it is, 
you know, I'm not perfect with integrity, but I am a man of integrity, woman of, in- of integrity, whatever you whatever you want to call yourself of integrity. It's like I am a person of integrity. And the way that I can measure that is when I break a promise or an agreement with myself or someone else, I clean it up. And the way I clean it up is I create something new. Now, what is something new? Well, it's a way, it's a structure that you haven't used before. If it's about being on time, maybe you need to set some alerts. Maybe you need to get out of bed 15 minutes earlier. Maybe you need to look at your calendar the night before. Maybe you fill in the blank, right? There's infinite possibilities. But if you end up doing something the same way, like, oh, well, I'm just going to try harder. That's not something new. Oh, I'm just going to do a better job looking at my phone. That's not something new. Oh, I'm, I had the calendar on my event. I'm going to do a, a I'm going to increase my effort and in checking my calendar. That is not something new. You get it? So it has to be something new. And when it comes to your trading, it comes to your finances, guys, something new is often like uh, a reminder. It's uh, sometimes it can be getting a coach. Sometimes it can be like enrolling in a class or a course or a webinar like this, whatever it is, where you actually put yourself in a position that's new. And here's the beautiful thing. This is why you don't have to feel any shame. That new thing may not work. It's just a possibility. You don't know what's going to work for you. And frankly, I have coached hundreds of people. I coach people every year, high level executives. And the beautiful thing is I find that what works for one executive does not work for another. And the structure that ends up working for this person often doesn't work for this person. And so for me to write a book on like, here are the seven steps or here are the five things to make you successful in trading would be just completely idiotic in a world of infinite possibilities where you are a very unique tool in the market. Very unique. What's going to work for you may not work for me. You know, early to bed, early to rise, throw it out. That may not be something that actually works. And when you start to get the freedom of like, oh, I get to create my own structures. I get to see what works for me. You'll actually find that your velocity and like having integrity, getting hitting your goals, hitting them faster. In fact, I I call that power. Uh, I don't have time to go through that, but power is the velocity uh, at which you obtain things. And so it just adds more power, right? Based on that definition. So guys, that really sums it up. But if you're if you're struggling with your trading, if you're looking to improve your finances, make sure that when you're cleaning things up and you're noticing there's lack of integrity, that a new structure is what's put in place. Because if it's not new, you're you're just repeating the same thing, expecting a different result. And we all know, I know, I know it's cliche. We all know what that means. It's just the definition of insanity. And I I don't like watching my members walking around insane. So Let's jump into the news. What I've got up next for you guys is this attack on Israel. And what I'm going to bring up, because a lot of the news is just, and it is, it's a tragedy. And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. I'm not an expert, but I'm here to talk about the market and impact and things. You know, I really see the world through this view from a monetary standpoint, from a macro, micro economic standpoint. And so when I saw this attack on Israel, this rising conflict, it was like, okay, how's this going to affect the markets, right? And that's just where my brain goes. And so I want to kind of let you in my world for a second. So I'm going to bring up a chart. And I wonder if your minds are going to the same place, but it's kind of hard to ignore this. Like, we're going to be talking about oil. And I know this doesn't say oil at the top of this, but this is an oil chart. And this is the price of oil over about the last 30 days, the last month. And you can see since the attack uh, on Israel, the spike in oil prices. And we've gone literally from almost $84 a barrel to almost $90, which is a significant one, two, three, four, five, six, six ish percent increase in oil prices. And there's a reason for that. Conflict in the Middle East notoriously leads to an increase in oil prices. And I can help kind of like tell you how the dominoes fall or how the dots are connected, but you've got to get that the Middle East is tied significantly. The Palestine regions, their ally is Iran. And Iran is where there's tons of oil. And 
Iran has recently, or more recently than not, really severed ties with the U.S. and the petrodollar and really has started shifting towards Russia and China in the BRICS system. And so they're saying, no, 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 we're not going to do this dollar petrol thing. We're going to help get China their oil without having to go through the dollar. We're going to help Russia get their oil without having to go through the dollar. And so this is happening, and they're kind of allies in this thing. And so as less countries use the dollar to buy oil, the cost of oil by the dollar goes up. And it's just, this is how uh, the markets work 101, right? And so we're, we are seeing a spike in oil. And I would say as things escalate, if things escalate, uh, the price of oil will continue to go up just from that. Now, how does this affect the markets? Well, war is never good for, for the markets. It's never good for GDP. It often can help get you out of recessions. It can often help you get you out of depressions as it makes the markets more productive. And you have to win the war, right? That has to be something that happens also. In the US, we just say, oh, well, war is good for us because we win every war, right? We're kind of this dominant war monger uh, that goes out. And you know, anytime there's something that one of our allies has a problem with, we send a bunch of money. We have these proxy wars across the globe. Now, having said that, the markets are going to be affected. And let me tell you why. We've got two wars going on, right? The one in Ukraine, we've got now one, I don't know if we call it a full es escalated war, but a terrorist attack in Israel. And frankly, it's not good for the markets. And I'll tell you why. Borders go up, trade shrinks, contracts, and trust among nations diminishes. In fact, we just had a warning last week uh, around trade, or excuse me, around travel, where the U.S. basically just said, hey, if you're traveling out of the U.S. anywhere, be more cautious than possible. I think we just hit what's called red alert status because we have a lot of conflicts out of the country right now. And so if you think that's happening with just travel, imagine what's happening with trade. We have more sanctions on countries than we've ever had. And our trade right now is getting constricted because when war happens, you, you have a hard time getting things through borders and boundaries. And frankly, a lot of our trade partners, specifically even in China, uh, who are more partners with this, you know, we already made the connections and dots, Iran and uh, kind of the Palestine nation, this becomes an issue uh, for trade. And when trade diminishes, GDP drops for whoever the players are. For us, if it, our trade is with us in China, if we have some type of conflict, GDP is going to drop for both uh, areas because it's hard to get things across the border. It's hard to get things across the seas. And then we start sanctioning each other and taxing each other uh, to, to try to flex. And it's just, frankly, it's not good for the markets, guys. War is not good for the markets initially. And so my initial reaction to this conflict is a recession. And we saw this happen uh, in our own country, even when we had a major attack and major, uh, what, what would we call that? An, a major terrorist threat, even in our country, the markets contracted for a little while. And then we went to war, we went to Afghanistan, which was this we're still not quite sure uh, why what the lasting impact was over there, other than we spent a ton of money. So, I mean, these are my opinions, guys. Obviously, I'm open to be wrong. I'm not the expert on uh, global trade. I'm not the expert on uh, what's happening in Israel, but there is financial impacts. And so I would see the markets contracting to this and watching if things escalate, the markets are going to react to that. If things start to uh, kind of convex and come together, uh, we're going to see uh, markets rally as trade becomes easier to do and our trust be between nations goes up. So it just makes a lot of sense. If you don't trust your neighbor, you're going to trade less with your neighbor. Pretty simple. So let's jump into the U.S. economy. I, I, had, I saw the craziest thing this week. I had a friend send me this article and I was just blown away by it. And I'm literally going to show you almost every chart that was on this article, but I've added two of my own. And this entire article was basically the topic was the U.S. economy is booming. That was the, the argument. That was the perspective that this individual decided to take using these charts. I'm going to use 
one, two, three, four, five. It looks like six of the same charts and two of them are mine. So four of these charts was his, two of them are mine. And by the way, these weren't his charts. All the credits are on the charts. Uh, they're from other sources. But the argument he was making that we were, that we're like in a boom was blowing my mind. And it was so apparent that he just didn't have the data or knew the data, or he just doesn't even know. He's just regurgitating stuff because it's getting clicks. But I, I, I'm going to bring you into the know because there's a lot of this going on right now. The mainstream media, call it legacy media right now, is, is putting up a blanket around how well the economy is doing. You can speculate why. You know, I'll let you, I'll let my audience decide on why. I think it's very it's highly politically charged why we're doing this, but it's just not the truth. And so if you're watching mainstream media and basing your trades off of what's happening on that on those news circuits and I'm talking about every mainstream media from Fox, CNN, MSNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, all of them. All of them. If you're taking your news in from those places and they're telling you that the market's good, and that we're going through a boom, they are lying straight to your face because they're not taking in uh, two data points that I'm going to point out. So this was the first chart that I saw on this article. And it's the difference between countries, 2023 real GDP and the IMF's pandemic projections. Now, the IMF is the International Monetary Fund. And this was a projection they did pre-pandemic saying, this is where we think the economy is going to be in two to three years based on you know GDP. And so the U.S. came in above zero. We're not negative. We're at, you could even say, where we were projected to be. So you could almost say the International Monetary Fund hit the nail right on the head. Good for those guys. Great analysts. Good predictors. And then advanced economies, you know, economies like China and Europe and, and so forth, you know, they were negative 1% uh, below prediction. The euro area was like negative 2% below prediction. The entire globe was over 3% below prediction. China, four, they're having a housing crisis. Uh, one of my videos this week talked about that. And then all emerging uh, economies, almost seven, negative 7% 7 below predicted. So obviously you could look at this chart and you'd be like, the US economy is booming. We're, we're, GDP is growing uh, at the level the IMF said. This is amazing. The world must be in a, a great place. Well, let me bring in this uh, chart on real GDP. So I'm going to just show you guys this really quick. And this was a chart he did uh, not select. So this was a, oh, oh, that's not it. This was a chart that for whatever reason he chose not to use. <laughs> and this is real GDP. And I want you to just do the math with me. Uh, really quick. And I might have to get my calculator out because I did this earlier. But the chart goes from like 20, you know, let's just call it like 20,000 to 22,000. So I did the math. What was the numbers on this? 20 to 22,000 was like a 7.28%. 7, 7 so if you take this back three years, so this is a three-year chart. If you take it back, this is pre-pandemic, to current GDP has grown from like 20 trillion to 22 trillion annually, right? So we had like a 2.23% in or 2.2 trillion increase in GDP. Overall growth is about a seven. If I if I remember, it was like seven and a half percent growth if I did the numbers right. Um, and so you'd think that's great. Even through the pandemic, we GDP grew by seven percent. Okay. Uh, but what about this missing piece that we always, for whatever reason, forget to talk about, and that's inflation. And this is like the one chart, guys, that everyone hesitates on mainstream media to talk about. And it's the one chart that brings you into reality around what's actually happening. This is inflation. I'm not making these numbers up. The first year, so again, three years, you guys can ignore the stuff be, before that. We're we're used to about 2% inflation. It's kind of marked into the market with the feds. We like it. It's actually healthy in a growing economy. 
But if you look at 21, 22, and 23, we had a 7% inflation one year. So just add this up with me. Six and a half on the second year. So now we're at 13.5%. And then you add another three and a half, uh, three point seven. I'm just gonna do the math really quick. Seven plus 6.5 plus 3.7. So 17.2%. Now let's just say GDP only grew 7%. I think it was 7.5%. You take inflation and now after inflation, you're negative 10% because we actually had 17% diminishing power, diminishing purchasing power but only 7% growth in GDP. So what was true, I don't know if this is even a real definition, but what was true GDP or adjusted GDP to inflation? It was actually negative 10%. And so when you look at this chart again, let's see if I can find it. But if you look at this chart, let me bring this back up. There it is. If you look at this chart again, it's like, what? This doesn't matter. None of this matters because at zero, we're at negative 10. And then everything else, just tack on another negative 10%, guys, because after inflation, even with growth in GDP, like all of these, all of these areas had some growth, right? Uh, it was just wasn't at projected but when you factor this in this is insane like to even to even point that we had growth to even point that our economy is booming is based on inflationary numbers no one's factoring in true or adjusted gdp true or adjusted growth true or adjusted uh cpi ppe and it's like when you take inflation into that number, three years of inflation is over 17%, guys. Your dollar, it's like you just take a sliver of it off, rip it off, and that's what it's worth now. Like you lost 17% buying power over the last three years. And so if your accounts didn't grow by 17%, we're going to talk about a, another topic. If your wages didn't grow by 17%, then you are behind the curve. Well, this guy was so bold to bring up this chart. And again, it's just blowing my mind. He brought up this chart as part of his argument. Well, you know, the economy is doing so good. Here we go. Here's real wages. Wages are back on track, you know, and here's the mean. This dotted line kind of shows the mean. And, you know, previous, we were having wage increases all the way to 2020. Pandemic hit. And then because of this weird people didn't want to work and people really needed to have certain jobs, we had this massive spike. Uh, in wage increases, and then it dropped off. And now nationally, we're sitting at about 25. Well, if you go from $24 to 25 over a three-year period, and you factor in inflation at 17% over those three years, guess where wages should be? Not 26, not 27, 28. Wages after inflation, if that's all we did was adjusted for inflation, not growth, not our economy growing, nothing, just inflation. Wages should be at $28 today. And so this little spike that happened actually was taking us into the right direction. But to say that this chart is a reflection of something positive that's happened, I mean, everyone that I'm talking to would agree, you feel poorer than you were and 2020, everyone would say that. Everyone would say things cost way more. My dollar's not going as far. I'm struggling more than before. If you look at U.S. savings account, they're at all times all time lows. Uh, U.S. national debt and credit card debts all time highs. It's like wake up, dude. But the reason that articles like this get traction is there's some there's some cabal. There's some uh, <laughs> there's some type of handshake agreement between these uh, legacy news outlets and what's actually happening. They want us to buy this narrative that the economy is doing well. I personally think it's a political move, a handshake political move. But I, guys, the numbers are, the, you just can't lie about this stuff.
You just can't. You can admit things like this gentleman decided to do, but at the end of the day, I mean, you, you can't lie about this stuff. The data is the data, but you got to take in the whole picture, right? You got to bring in inflation. And this guy just completely ignored inflation in his entire article. It, it was, as you can tell, I'm really upset about this. I want to talk about one more thing, which is kind of the silver lining, okay? It, this is the positive news we could say for the day. And what this is, is headline HICP and core HICP, HICP being the harmonized index, uh, harmonized index of consumer price. So this is like CPI harmonized, and we are taking nations, countries as an example. And so on the left, what I want you to focus on is you can, you know, you can see Italy at the top, Germany, UK, France, Euro area, Canada, Japan, US. What this is showing is a year-on-year -year percentage of how we are doing in, in terms of cost of goods, like these consumer prices. Uh, that You could even say this is kind of an inflationary chart. It was really interesting to me that he didn't bring up an inflation chart, but he did bring this chart up because this is kind of positive news. And what I'm seeing on this chart is really a silver lining, that the U.S., if you go back to when we started dropping consumer prices, when things and we started taming inflation, we kind of did it before any of the other nations. And we did it faster than most of the other nations also. You can see that we are almost at zero, meaning where we used to be year on year percentage compared to the rest of the world. Canada has kept up really well, being kind of our North America ally, uh, they follow our GDP and our inflation really close. But these other nations lagged behind, and they're paying the price for it, specifically China right now. If you go to the core side, you can see the same thing. But what concerns me is the, is the thing that didn't get talked about at all this article is this tick up. We came off, and a soft landing would look flat. A soft landing would finally level off. And what we're actually seeing in both charts is a spike. And so uh, third quarter is coming in. Fourth quarter, we're going to see the data at the end of the year. We're going to, this chart updated is going to be really interesting to see if we're ticking back up. And it was predicted by not many, but a, a couple of my favorite analysts that we would have inflation. Then we'd go through a, a period of deflation and we'd actually go through a second wave. And I think you're, what you're actually going to hear next year is more about second inflationary wave. And I just don't see how you can't have that. It's very natural when you throw a rock in a pond to have the major splash and then the ripple. It's very common that when you have an earthquake that you have aftershocks. It is next to impossible to land a plane on something that just got jarred up and down. It's like you're going to hit that first bump. Then you're going to have to kind of try to land on the second or third bump on the runway. And so bringing this plane down, our economy, so to speak, and having a soft landing is becoming increasingly difficult. And the more that we have uh, inflation, the more that we have like our cost of goods going up or GDP going down or the wars escalating, This it's like more variables makes getting this plane down on the ground a lot more difficult. And so I am predicting not a soft landing. It's becoming increasingly difficult. I am, uh, based on this chart, the silver lining, I am grateful to have the people who are running our monetary policy who are. Meaning I think Jerome Powell has done a fantastic job. This is a reflection of him compared to the rest of the world. I mean, really, we've got the all-star team when it comes to our Federal Reserve. However, you know, they can only do so much. And I think we're going to have a rocky landing coming into 2025. All right. So moving smoothly uh, through this today, let me bring this up and see what we've got next. Yeah, mind blowing though, isn't it? Oh, we're right there. So I've got about 10 minutes left and we're going to go into our S&P 500 trade. So let's go ahead and bring that chart back up. here 
And if you're on listen only, and a lot of my my listeners uh, are on like a listen only basis, and that's fine. I I like to go through prices really well so that they don't have to actually be watching to get this. But if you're watching it, it helps a ton. The S and P 500. I mean, I don't think we could have done a better job of this. But we started to go into this short trend based on the top of the candles that were coming in uh, later in this week. And that's just something I drew in. So we can, I'm just going to delete this, pretend that wasn't there. But we were in this long-term short trend and then we started oscillating, right? We started having this down spike, up spike, and now we're in this new down spike. And we've got to draw in some new uh, support and resistance, nonlinear support and resistance. So I'm going to zoom in on this and get this dialed in. And I'll show you a little trick also that you can do if you're struggling to do this. Yeah, this is so tight. If you're struggling to do this or trust this on a daily, which I do not blame you if you are, uh, you can always move to a different time frame. And let me show you what I mean by that. If you go to a four hour chart, you're going to be able to grab this channel a lot better than you would be on a daily chart because you're just not getting the candles. But you can clearly see like this is the channel we're in right now. And it's tight. It's really tight. Um, and like we've talked about in the past, you know, here's the one that went up a couple of days before that. Here's the one that kind of went sideways. But um, what I'm getting at is when you're in a tight channel, the likelihood of a breakout is higher or lower. It's higher because the tighter it is, the less room there is. And when it breaks, they break hard. However, because we're, we've got some, we're in like a double factor, right? We're in a downtrend already. We're in a uh, long term. We're in a downtrend short term. and we kind of called the price out coming into this area. We have some fundamentals. I mean, fundamentals aren't great, guys. I just shared it with you. Like, I, I've not got good news for the S&P 500. I did not have good news for the economy. And global news is not good for the economy right now. It's not good for GDP and escalating wars, rumors of wars. Uh, it, like we talked about, tears down our trade trust which affects our profitability because then we got to start taking things in house. And now we're like, Oh, should I, should I be making this in the U S right now? Yeah, but it's going to cost more, but then I can at least ensure that my product, you know, gets across, you know, it doesn't have to come across an ocean. It's, it's here and it's ready. And so that's the type of thoughts that we have when we're going to war or we have uh, these conflicts overseas is we're we're relying heavily on China for a lot of our production, a lot of our industry production. If we start getting into a higher conflict with China, we're going to start looking to bring that stuff back, and that's really expensive to do. So that will no question affect GDP. Um, but let's go looking forward. So I'm going to draw a line on here so we know what today is. We'll get rid of last week's. So here's today, so we know where we're at. Clearly, we're... We've got room to go. And based on the long-term channel, we're kind of right in the middle of this thing. And I can illustrate that just drawing a Fibonacci tool. But like from the high to the bottom of this, our 50% level is right here. And guess where that's the middle of? It's the middle of our support and resistance also. So I'm a little, I'm going to be a little hesitant unless we get some really strong fundamental news that this is going bearish. I'm going to be a little hesitant to say, hey, price is likely going to drop below the 4,200 level. It's pretty simple. It's pretty easy for me to say, like, we're going to have price range. Whoops, don't move that one. We're going to have price range. I got to draw this ellipse. Kind of in this region. And I'm going to tighten this up a little bit because otherwise. But it's likely to be in this region. Meaning like to have it go down, eh, I'm not, I'm not, yes, it could, but this 42 would likely hold because you're right in the center of our uh, channel, but you're also right in the center of our support and resistance levels. 
And so I think it's pretty likely that you're going to see the price here. Now, what does this mean? It's going to be pretty difficult to get a breakout. We're going to have one, maybe one or two days before the breakout towards the upside on this channel. Because of how tight this is, guys, you're going to have to do it on a four-hour chart. And so let me draw this on here so we know where we're at today. And when you're drawing these on a four-hour chart, you got to make sure that you extend them far enough also. So let me just extend this out. Sometimes it's just easier to redraw these. <laughs> so what I'm doing, guys, is I'm drawing this short trend on the S&P 500 and extending it out. So this is it going outward. I'm using the highs as kind of my plane. And so this is likely where it's going to go. But if it breaks out of here to the upside, then we're going to have some room to make a trade that way also and then our take profits and stops are going to be within that region that we shared on the one hour chart so we could get a breakout either way obviously a breakout to the upside is going to have a little bit more velocity than towards the downside but you can see on here if we go back to our daily come on delete this that if we brought this in and i'm going to just manipulate this channel just to here because it's going to be tighter than that really use your four hour guys on this channel but if we get a breakout to the upside the risk to reward on this isn't great because you're gonna have your stops below 4200 above 3331 and so like you're going to be at like almost a one to one ratio your stops going to be down here you're going to be taking to take profits somewhere probably up into here in fact it, you may be on like a two to one where your risk is two reward is one so i don't love these trades uh you saw on my gold example why i liked the last trade is because our stop was so tight it was at 1878 ish right 1875 but the potential upside was enormous and so I love trades where my risk is smaller than my reward in this and, you know, and the probability of technicals and fundamentals are going in your direction. This I don't love and just put me on record for that. I don't love this trade. This is kind of a wash trade. We're likely going to get some sideways momentum unless the fundamentals break. Now, if it goes into the short side, if you get a break below 4,200, that's when you could have a great sell off. You could put your uh, take profit far below this which is going to be in fact we're going to probably have to mark some of those going in let's do that right now we have to find our new support level there's a couple of them here we've got one right there and then there's all another one right below it so there's our new support if we get a breakout guys almost 4100 it probably is 4100 and then you also have one at 40 uh 56 so that is our setup breakout towards the downside stop loss just above here take profit down here but i really think the price is going to stay in this region so if you get a breakout of the channel you could take a buy but keep your stops close guys because this sideways momentum is more for scalping uh which you could maybe maybe next week you kind of shift into a scalping uh method and you just start taking this kind of sideways momentum as i would be predicting all right um uh, i think that wraps up our day guys let me just make sure i've gone everything so we've talked about everything from the war in israel or you might call it more of a conflict we did our gold analysis Oh yeah, don't forget about this integrity thing, guys. Take that home. If I were to give you a takeaway, it's take this integrity intervention idea, this concept, and apply it to just one thing in your trading, one thing with your investing, your wealth, you know, whatever it is you're trying to grow. Apply it to one thing that you're you're noticing a hole in the bridge, 
and make sure that you apply a new structure to it, something that you've never tried or done before, and see if that doesn't elevate or add a new velocity towards the goal that you're going towards. And I, I can promise you that it will. I've not worked with any student or person that I personally coached and done used integrity as like the basis of our foundation and not had their life start getting velocity and all the things that they wanted. Um, we went over this kind of economy. You guys have a full picture now of what the economy looks like with all of the data, not part of the data. And then we just wrapped up our S&P 500 trade. That wraps up our uh, hour and my time with you guys. Thanks for being on here. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure to show your support uh, through my social by liking, following, and subscribing. This is a thing I do for the public. So if you have friends, family, people, uh, whether it's colleagues, people you work with that might benefit from this data or this uh, podcast, feel free to share it. I do this publicly for free for you. And so uh, showing your support means a lot to me. So I'd appreciate that. And uh, that wraps up our session today. So we will see you guys uh, same time, same place next week. And uh, if you have anything you'd like me to cover, throw it in the comment sections on my social. Until next time, guys, have a great uh, weekend. Thank you.